Good morning. It is so good to be here with you this morning. I, I say a lot, and, and I'll say again, you know, I love Sunday mornings because it helps me uh, to be able to tune all the distractions out of my life and focus on the most important thing. And I'll tell you what, in today's world, there's a lot of distractions. Uh, but our God is doing some amazing work in this world, and sometimes our news might not show it, but when you stop and you reflect on all that God is doing within our church, within our families, there's a lot to celebrate this morning, and I'm thankful for that. And, and one of those things that we get to celebrate is that uh, Nathan's not going to preach to you this morning. Uh, in fact, I have a special guest. It's a special morning for me. Uh, my dear brother, Jason Rollins, is here. And uh, Jason and I and Jen and I are old Sunset Pals. Back in, we figured, 2013 the other night. Uh, so we go way back and have some great memories that Jason is not going to share. <laughs> uh, he knows me a little too well. Uh, but I'm going to call Jason up here and... and his wife, Jen, and Amelia are there in the back. I'll have them stand up real quick. She, I knew she was going to love that. Just no, real no, quick. No. Uh, let me tell you something. There she is, yeah. <laughs> and Amelia, her, her, their daughter is there, six years old, nine, nine. years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I knew her when she was this big. So it's, it's been great to see them. Uh, but I'll tell you, they are new missionaries that we are supporting as a church now in doing a work in Canada. I don't know if you're going to talk to us a little bit about that a snippet of that. Uh, but we'll hear more about that in October, which is our missions month. And we're going to give you the whole update on what this mission work is that he's doing, planning these house churches in Canada. And I'll tell you what, this is a very, very faithful family that you're seeing because their mission team, as they went, they had a plan and things fell apart, but they've stayed true. And when now they're the only uh, ones on the original team that are still there and they're keeping the work going and doing some great and amazing things. So Jason, I'm going to say a prayer over you this morning and then he's going to preach the word to us. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are and, and I thank you for all that you do for us. And, and looking back over uh, the course of, of my life, uh, I thank you for godly role models that you placed in my life. And I thank you for Jason and Jen in particular right now and the example they set to me as a young man many years ago. And for the faith that they had then and the faith that they have lived out consistently throughout. You know, in class this morning, we were talking about being uh, stable and rock solid. And that describes the faith of these two people. And so, God, I pray a blessing over Jason this morning as he preaches the word to us. I pray that you give him confidence and courage in the things that he's prepared. And I pray that you help our hearts to be open to receive what he's going to share with us. This is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. preach the word to Thank us, brother. You. Make sure I get this thing. Oh, it is on. I hear it. Um, appreciate that. Nathan, it's been since 2013 that um, our family has actually seen Nathan. When he graduated, he was gone. Uh, he took off. Um, if if you all want some dirt on Nathan, we'll meet over in the corner afterwards. Um, and if that goes long, I'll give you my email address. Um, we can... Just kidding. Um, I know y'all are uh, in good hands with Nathan. I've always appreciated his heart, and I have appreciated his preaching. Uh, even from the first time that I heard him, I knew uh, he had some experience because uh, it, it showed. And he comes from a long line of uh, a family in ministry and teachers and preachers of the gospel who are as well faithful. And so uh, we always appreciated Nathan, even though um, we get to make fun of him sometimes. So. That's kind of nice. Um, uh, am I supposed to have a remote for the PowerPoint? Okay. Um, anyway, um, there we are. Um, this morning, uh, I'm going to preach um, coming out of the book of Isaiah. But before we get there, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my family. We moved uh, to Guelph, Ontario, Canada, uh, which is just west of Toronto. And uh, we moved there back in 2015. And uh, this September, it'll be seven years since we've been there. I can't believe we've been there that long. It seems uh, really uh, kind of a short time period we've been there. Uh, as Nathan said, we moved up there with a couple, um, and we started uh, a church in our house. And uh, we now have two house churches that are meeting in the city of Guelph, uh, one in my house again, and one in uh, another couple that uh, decided to join our ministry. They are from Canada, 
and they have a house church in uh, their home as well, working faithfully in their part of the city, and uh, good things are happening. Uh, it takes a little momentum uh, to get things going from scratch, and a lot of prayer and a lot of effort. And so uh, we're thankful and grateful where we are uh, to be here in the United States. Um, as you all know, COVID hit in 2020, and it affected everybody, everything. The planet literally shut down, and, and that included the border between the United States and Canada. And uh, we, we've been watching that border um, try and reopen for a couple of years. And when we started hearing um, that they might open it and let people go back and forth, we decided let's make some plans to get down here. And it's been good to see people, to meet new people, to see our family we haven't seen in a few years. So it's been great uh, to be here so far. Um, I, uh, before I got into ministry, uh, I was in home building. I was a carpenter. And uh, flip it to the next slide. Uh, there are a, a few things in carpentry that you've got to deal with. And um, we talk a lot about uh, renovation or restoration. And uh, it's not just limited to those things, though. Um, when, when we would go into a house, you have to take a look at what's going on with the house. Does this thing need repairs? Does it, it need a rebuild? Does it need a renovation or a restoration? We would do all of that. We went in and, and we would do everything. Uh, sometimes we would do repairs. This would include renovations. What I would include renovation parts of a house were beyond repair, and so we needed to do a little bit of rebuilding. Uh, repairs, sorry. Um, we also had the rebuilding part uh, water damage, uh, fire damage, roof issues, whatever it was, if that were beyond repair, of course a rebuild is necessary. Sometimes we would do restorations, and those were uh, my favorite. We actually had uh, one house that we did that was built in the, the mid-1700s. It was a farmhouse, and uh, from where I come from in Maine, uh, there's a lot of those older homes. People like to keep those uh, older homes and keep them up, and the historical societies love that too. Uh, because there's a story, they tell a story. And uh, this one farmhouse that we did, the flooring um, was beautiful, wide plank wood flooring. And we had to match that, and we had to be meticulous. We had to look at all of the details and, and make that work and fit perfectly. And, and the molding that goes around the ceilings and all the trim work around windows and doors, you need to be meticulous with details. But there's also one other thing that you need, is you need partners, you need people uh, to work with you, people that work alongside you, people that are there to even encourage you when that piece of wood just doesn't fit. When it doesn't work, you want to take the hammer and you want to smash it in there, but you can't because that piece of wood costs a lot of money because it was a custom cut piece of wood and it's got a special uh, place uh, to go and so you can't destroy that. It, it's always uh, extremely fun to take new things and to blend it in with old. And that seems to be a trend these days, to take the new and blend it in with the old. Uh, can you turn it to the next slide? And when you look around the world, and really it doesn't take that much effort to look, but what do you see? What do you see? The world is in need of rebuilding. It's in need of repairs. The world is in need of restoration, much like the homes that I used to, to work on. And you may not even have to look around the world. It may be just here in your own backyard, the backyard of this church family, your own backyard in your neighborhood, whatever it may be. And this is really what I want to take a few minutes uh, to talk about today. We're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 58. If you'll turn your, with me to Isaiah chapter 58, I did not include it up on the slides. We're going to old school today, so if you have a paper Bible, pull it out, or you can use your phone, I'll let you do that, that's okay. Isaiah chapter 58. We'll start reading in verse 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says, cry loudly, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation that has done righteousness and has not uh, forsaken the ordinance of their God. They ask me for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have you fasted and you do not see? Why have you humbled 
ourselves? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and uh, to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose? A day for a man to humble himself. Or is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day of the Lord? Let's stop right there for a moment. Isaiah is a very very interesting book. It's not too complicated, but there are sections of this book. The beginning section is pre-exile. There's a short middle section that is in exile. And then there's the later chapters, including chapter 58, which are post exile. And so you get these different snippets and good pictures that Isaiah portrays of what's going on in Israel and even in exile. And Isaiah changes the tone here for a bit. Verse 6, is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst. To pointing, excuse me, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Isaiah paints a picture for us here in this section of his writing, and he doesn't paint it for us. He paints this picture for those people at that time in Israel, but he gives us the picture of what God desires for that people and what he wanted from the beginning of that people. This section of Isaiah, a little background, begins around chapter 56, where Isaiah talks about the salvation of the nations, and not just the nation of Israel, but the many nations. And that's what really Isaiah is all about. So much of what he talks about is spreading out the tent of the kingdom of God, pulling those tent pegs wider and wider and wider so that all of the nations will stream into the mountain, and not physically the mountain, but you and I, the mountain, as the Hebrews writer says. The condemnation of the righteous, excuse me, the unrighteous leaders is brought forward in chapter 56 as if in a courtroom scene. Your leadership is in trouble. And he says, the condemnation of the idolatry of all that you have partaken in as well. It's not just the the leaders of, of this nation. It's everybody has partaken. You've followed the leaders. But then Isaiah quickly moves into God's healing. And he quickly moves into the repentance of the many in chapter 57 and how that will take place in this chapter, in chapter 58, which is really the focal point of what I want to talk to, talk about. Isaiah, of course, by the Spirit of God, lays out such a beautiful picture of what God's vision is, and it stands juxtaposed to what the Israelites thought was best. The first thing I want to take a look at is rebuild. I think if you turn the next slide. Rebuild. This this really all comes from verse 12. So I'm going to read verse 12 again. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets or the paths in which to dwell. 
The word that Isaiah uses here for rebuild is really the same word that is used in Genesis to talk about how God pulled a rib out of Adam and fashioned the woman. It's the same word. It's a different tense, but it's the same word. Interesting. That should, that should draw your mind to something very intentional and to something very specific. There's something beautiful that God is doing here. It's the same word. And when we dig a little deeper, this word more literally points to the foundations of all of the buildings of the city of Jerusalem and even wider and broader, the nation of Israel. It points to the foundations. Well, now, why does he start there? You see, the vision here is about putting the city back together. It's as if your older brother came in as you were building a Lego city and stomped and kicked and threw and thrashed those Legos all over the room. You remember those days, right, Nathan? My brother would do that with me when I was young. And what it takes is some intentionality to seek out and find all of those pieces and to bring them back, put them in a pile and start to rebuild those foundations. The vision here is about putting everything back together. Isaiah has previously in this prophecy, in this book, graphically laid out before the people how their sins affected everything around them, not just emotionally and spiritually, but relationally and physically, the land was ravaged. As, as God pulls the Israelites out of the land of Israel, the Chaldeans now move in and they would have ravaged that place for the extended time of that exile in Babylon. And they would have destroyed, they would have overused the resources, they would have taken over what they could have, they would have removed things, and they would have stolen things that were left. So they ravaged the land and Isaiah portrays this picture in a very solemn moment in this prophecy, before this chapter, says, your sin has caused this. God warned you at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. He warns them, choose life. If you choose life, I will bless. But if you choose this over here, if you choose yourself, if you choose something else, bad things will come. God warned them. Move on to the next slide, please. The next thing that Isaiah lays out here is about repair. And we think about repair as this, uh, this thing. If, if this handrail were to break, I would need to pull it back up and repair it. And the word that Isaiah uses for repair is literally to raise up the walls, to pull up the walls. Now, when I was in carpentry and we wanted to raise a wall, there were a few things that needed to happen. First of all, we need to check the wall was square, the wall was straight, that the foundation was straight, because if the foundation is off, the rest of the building to the top of the roof is off. We, we also needed to check that we had enough bodies to lift that wall, to lift and replace and repair that wall, because... I don't know if you've ever been on a job site to lift up a wall. No one person can do that unless it's probably five or six feet. That's it. And if the wall was really big, we would use tools like you see on the screen there. Those are called wall jacks. And they would lift the walls for us. They were the tools that we used. We would crank those up. Those are pretty special ones. Those are electric, man. I wish we had those. We still had to crank up the wall jacks in order for that wall to come up. It took extra care as well because that wall could slide off the foundation at any moment if you were going too fast. So it took extra care. You see, the consequences of the sin of Israel left the land and the city of Jerusalem and the temple in disrepair. The land was in a state that the people would not have recognized anything about it. And we see this in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah when the people come back and they start to come back one by one, little by little. And they're taking a look at their own homes and they're like, well, this is where I used to live. And they start to rebuild their own things. They even get called out for rebuilding their homes before the Lord's home. But then you look at Nehemiah and you see that as they are struck to the heart, each one of them takes a trowel in hand 
and repairs the wall around the city that is in front of their own home. You see, that took initiative, that took intentionality, that took people looking and seeing, okay, I have a part in this. I had a part in the destruction of this, and I have a part in rebuilding this. Move on to the next slide, please. The, the next thing, the third thing that, that Isaiah points out here is the idea of res- restoration. The concept that Isaiah is referring to here is literally about restoring to bring back to bring back to a former state of being. You see, it's not, it's not okay that the walls around Jerusalem, the temple, the house of God is left where it's at. It needs to be restored. It needs to be brought back, and the people need to be brought back through that. You see, the nation of Israel was revered and feared by the nations before the exile. They were looked at as a small nation, but a powerful one. Their God was with them. And the city of Jerusalem and its temple were seen as the glory of the nations. This thing was beautiful. Solomon's temple was magnificent. It was uh, the most largest, the most magnificent, beautiful, perfect temple in those, those nations. But the consequences of their sin had changed the perspective of Israel from the nations. And you remember throughout the story of the Old Testament, Moses talks to God and Abraham talks to God, and they talk about the reputation of God. God, what will you do if you don't bring this people out of Exodus, the, the, the Exodus out of Egypt? If you don't bring them out, what are the people going to say? What are the nations going to say? And, and it's constantly brought up to God's mind, God, this is, this is what you need to do. It, this is about your reputation. And it had changed forever because of what the Israelites had done. Would there really be a place in all of the surrounding empires, in the minds of those people, that Israel would ever be the same? Would Israel live in the role of being a nation of priests to the world ever again? Or would God have to usher in a new kingdom, unlike any that had ever existed on this planet at any time? And that leads me to the next thought. What does this mean for us? Look at the next slide. What does this mean for us? I mean, it's a good story. It's a story that happened a long time ago. It's a story that that we find redemption in. We find beauty. We find grace. Yes, because there's these consequences of sin, and it was ugly, and it was terrible. And you see the people, they are transformed in the crucible of Babylon. So what does this mean for us? I want to ask that question that I asked a few minutes ago. When you look around the world, when you look around your world, what problems do you see? What problems do you see? I mean, there's four up here. There's way more than four. What is the one thing that when you see it on the news, on the internet, in person, that it strikes your heart and you say to yourself, I I have to do something. I have to change this. But why is this going on? Why, Why are we allowed to live like this? What is wrong with the world? What is the one thing that when you see it, You are struck and you just have to do something about it. It can be something that you have personally experienced. It can be something that you've gone through. It can be something that you've seen someone close to you gone through. There's so many addictions, riots, famine, single motherhood, uh, and and trying to, to live a decent life in that Uh, people coming out of several, uh, any number of different addictions. And I'm so grateful for programs like Celebrate Recovery. That's a beautiful program. And there's so many more. There's so many more problems. And Israel is really just a tiny little picture of the greater world the world at large. And we can look at these things and we can become angry. 
We can become mad and we can stay in that state. But if you look at what God says through Isaiah, he says that if you change your perspective of what a fast is, they had these prescribed days of fasting. And he says, if you change your perspective, he says, this is God's perspective. It it is not the fast that I choose. Is this not it right here? To loosen the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into the house, and when you see the naked, to cover him up? Is this not the fast that I choose? That then when you do these things, your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will be speedily brought forth and your righteousness will be before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. He will protect you. He will surround you. He will be with you. And then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and you will say, here I am. God will say, here I am. And if you remove the yoke from your midst... Take the yoke off yourself. Stop pointing the finger and speaking wickedness. And if you look and you live your lives according to God, verse 10, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like the midday. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and he will give strength to your bones, and you will be like a watered garden and a spring of water with waters that don't fail. That is a picture not just of Israel. That's what God wanted from the beginning. Ever since he brought in the law, he wanted the people to be a nation of priests to the other nations, not just the nation that had priests that ministered to those people, but a a nation of people who saw themselves as priests. Now we know, Paul writes the Roman letter, this beautiful picture of the spiritual Israel. That's us. That's us. You see, God brought them out of exile to continue the line, the seed to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And he saved the world. And he created this new kingdom, you and I, this church, this family of believers who lived in this kind of fasting. This idea that we are people who preach truth that is always shackled to grace. John chapter 1 says, Moses, the law, came preaching truth. But Jesus came preaching truth and grace. You see, and a part of that truth and grace is that God cares about your well-being, and he cares about the well-being of everybody on this planet, even people who are in addictions, who are homeless, who are hurting, who are dying every day. He cares about every one of them. Why? Because he created them. He formed, he fashioned them, and he called them his children. This picture that Isaiah puts up for us, if you move to the next slide, if you just click through, there's probably nine of those, Uh, just keep clicking. There's different words that as you see in this scripture that come up, light, there's light. Your light will shine through the darkness. You will be called light. Just. You will be called a people who are just, who look out for the well-being of others. You will be called generous. You will not just hoard food for yourself, but you will share and you will go out to the homeless and the poor and you'll bring them into your homes. You will be called refreshing because you and I don't look at the world, right? We don't look at the world the way that culture does, right? We don't look at the world the way the news wants us to or the way anybody else wants us to except for the way that God demands in his word. We will be called refreshing. We will be called guides, people who lead others to the truth. And because God is the one who is guiding us, you'll be called protectors, people who go the extra effort to stand up for those who have nobody to stand up for. And that is at the heart of God when he speaks about widows and orphans and aliens. You will be called servants, people who go the extra mile, who who serve out of the heart that has been served by God. You will be called kind, 
people who are different, people who are not like the world. You will be called people who are kind. That's what this means to you and me. That's what this means to you and me. You see, as a carpenter, we always had the challenge of, of doing what the customer wanted, right? There's, there's this this picture on the piece of paper, the plans that you're going by, and you try to translate that into a 3D object, and that's always a challenge, but that's the fun in the challenge. But God's not really interested in that. Yes, he, he wants us to be people who, who live out our faith in our jobs, in our work, and that we do the best that we can everywhere and anywhere we can. But God is more interested in the reparation and the restoration, and the idea that this is what our world looks like without God. People for ages, centuries, have tried to tell everybody that it's useless, it's pointless. And, and recently, we have people telling us that you, you have a part. You can do whatever you want to help get this world back in its place. But without God, it is futile. Without God, it really goes nowhere. We can see the changes happening. We can see a little bit here and there, but most of the time, we end up with another problem. Most of the time, we end up with another thing that we have to focus on and try and fix ourselves. But with God, as the church as the ones who are called to let off the shackles of the nations and even of yourself, to be a nation who will be called, who will also be known as those who are repairers and those who are restorers and those who are rebuilders. That's what you and I are here for in 2022. And every one of us has a role, has a part in that. Every one of us has been placed in the church, the body that you've been placed in for a purpose. Paul told the Corinthian church that. You have been placed where you're at for a purpose. I know one thing that I struggle with is that I'm just one little guy. I'm just, just me. And I grew up in this tiny little town in Maine. What can I do? And that may be true. What can I do? Maybe not much, but what can two of us do? What can three of us do? What can 10 of us do? What can 20 of us do? What can 200 of us do? Because God is with us, because God has redeemed us, because God has restored, repaired, and rebuilt us, we can change the world. And because of God, if we continue to keep our eyes fixed on the cross, on him who despised the shame, we keep our eyes fixed on him, everything of this world will fade into the background. It's like that song that we sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world, the things that hurt you, that strike you to the heart, the people who are hurting and dying without a chance of knowing Jesus, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and in his grace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you are a God of redemption, that you are a God of restoration, of rebuilding, a God of of doing the necessary repairs. Father, I thank you that you are a God of truth, but also a God of grace. And that you love your people so much, that includes us. That you're willing to do whatever it takes to set us on the right path. God, I thank you that you look at the world and you don't see the problems. You see your children, your sons and daughters, people you have created. And you, you continually push us and nudge us and move us in the direction of helping restore the world, of, of helping repair the world. And we're grateful, God, to be a part of the family of God, to be a part of your family. 
and to see the great joy it is to be called into this big restoration project that you have started. And the great privilege it is, but also the great responsibility that is on our shoulders and not just our shoulders alone, but the shoulders of each one of us. And really by your power and by your strength and by your spirit. Father, we thank you for the love that you continually pour out on us and for how you continually show us what that means, the distances that you are willing to go to show us that you do love us and that you want the best for us. Father, we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Before I get down, uh, I just want to make sure uh, that you all understand that my family uh, is extremely grateful uh, for this church family. Uh, when the borders were closed, uh, we had run out of um, a, a partner had 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 to move on, and um, what were we to do? We, we can't travel. We can't go meet new people and see new people. But this church uh, stepped up and uh, blessed us in a way that we were not expecting, and uh, y'all are a part of that. And we're so glad that um, we can come here to be here and to meet some new faces and to to see that the family that we're a part of is much greater than ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Man, it's a pleasure to hear you again all these years, and uh, he does a great job, and it's influenced me so many times, uh, the, the talks in chapel, in our preaching labs, all the different times I got to hear you. Uh, you're so impactful. Thank you for sharing with us, man. And uh, look, we never want to leave a, a service without offering an invitation. And so this morning, as Jason so so wonderfully showed, man, our world, there's a lot that's fractured in our world. And our world needs our light to shine, for God to shine through us, right? But this morning, maybe in order for us to be able to shine our light out in the world, we need some encouragement this morning because while the whole world may be fractured, I know that there are families and individuals in this room who are fractured right now, and God has the power to rebuild and restore and repair us into his image. And so if you're feeling like you need prayers of this church, if you've never stepped into the blood of Christ, the waters of baptism in order to be a part of this forever family, the water's ready this morning, and you can do that. So whatever it is that you need, we have elders at the back if you would like to respond more privately. If you would like to come and have the prayers of the entire church pray over you, you can come forward and sit on this front row, and we'll take care of you that way. Whatever it is that you need, won't you come now as together we stand and sing.